So hi, everybody. Welcome to our first online lecture for the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center. Um, I, I don't really know how many people are joining us tonight, but I want to, um, first of all, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. We actually really missed not having our last community lecture. It's become such a big part of our routine and a great source of community outreach um, that it's nice at least to be able to try this format in these particular times. I'm gonna try and, and keep um, quite short and go a little bit quickly tonight because I wanna make sure in this format that we have enough time for our speakers and, and our questions. I do wanna start out though by thanking a couple of people in particular who um, this evening would not have been possible without and just did a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes. And that's Judy Beck from the Stem Cell Research Center. Um, and also just um, two really long time fantastic collaborators from UCI Media, Media who are on tonight and helping us to put this on, Will Alvarez and um, Kyle Good. So thanks you guys very much for all of your hard work behind the scenes. I'm sure that everyone who's here will join me in that. And many of you who've been with us before have um, heard me give at least a part of this, and I'm not going to give my, my normal routine. I really want to lead into a, a different topic about where we are with COVID-19 and, and what UCI is doing about that as a couple of introductory remarks. Most of you have heard me say that we are the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center, and we really span across the campus, over 50 faculty from six schools, 21 departments. And our goal is about discovery, basic science, teaching, both uh, at the undergraduate, at the graduate, at the medical school level, and at healing, really looking towards the translational spectrum of how we can apply our research. I talk typically about how to separate hope from hype when it comes to regenerative medicine and stem cell research, because we think this is a really important topic. I'm just reminding you about that um, tonight. And that this road to regenerative medicine and stem cell treatments for us in California the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine has been so critical. Um, we're actually a little bit on tenterhooks right now because we're not sure if the ballot initiative has qualified for the fall because as signatures were being finalized was just when California was being shut down to the due to the COVID-19 crisis. So California did a fantastic job of getting out ahead of much of the country and flattening our curve. And we're all really fortunate for that. Um, but we'll see where things are gonna be with CERN. We remain hopeful um, for now. Lots of people have been asking me. I also talk normally about um, the idea of a pipeline and how lots of things in the world run along a pipeline and research is really just the same as that. When we talk about that in the, the context of research though, it's usually as a translational pipeline, the idea that we're moving from bench through to bedside and on into clinical practice. And one point that I did wanna take the time to make tonight is that academic research institutions and universities really play a pivotal role in this. And many of you, whether you have been at one of our lectures previously or, or, or um, maybe at our January public lecture, community lecture, um, have heard me make this point that universities are really critical to this enterprise. And so I thought we should talk about that a little bit just in the context of where we are right now as a state and in the midst of this global pandemic. And so I wanna say a few words about research and COVID-19 and, and the role that UCI as an academic institution has been playing there. So if we think about research, and all of the different ways that research has an impact. One thing is, is about outcomes and relevance um, to what's going on in the community around us. And I'm not sure that everyone from the community that's joining us will realize how active UCI as a, a, a global center has really been in this area. And so I pulled just a few examples to highlight. I encourage you to go to UCI's uh, website and have a look at some of these things. Everything from UCI students here developing apps for phones in order to help do contact tracing in the future. In fact, there was an article in the local news about this just today. Um, UCI, uh, the Medical Center and School of Medicine was on board as one of the first clinical trial sites to test out remdesivir. We all know that that clinical trial has been halted now because it didn't show the stellar effect that we were hoping for, but that's actually exactly the point. You need to have academic medical centers in order to do the test, and that clinical testing along the translational pipeline is something that UCI is playing a key role in and that academic centers and university institutions is really, really pivotal. Coming back to CIRM, just to highlight quickly, um, you may have heard in the media or not that CIRM did a, a rapid response very quickly 
and allocated $5 million in emergency funding for COVID-19 research. In fact, some of the first allocation of this was to the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic. And I've spoken about the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic um, here at UCI as a part of our Stem Cell Research Center a number of times. In fact, there are six sites across the state. So the first funding that was allocated was to City of Hope, who's one of our Alpha Stem Cell Clinic partners. And we're looking ahead right now to having a trial for convalescent plasma um, that will go across all of the ASCCs as a clinical test, in fact, as a potential treatment for COVID-19. And so we're very much looking forward to participating in that. In addition to that, um, the Stem Cell Research Center took on the task of helping um, with the community testing effort that's necessary. In fact, as again, many of you have heard, um, there have has been a, a real shortage of reagents in terms of being able to enable testing across the country. And one of those is just the, the serum, the fluid that's necessary in order to store samples until the test can be run. And uh, the UCI Department of Pathology put out a call a number of weeks ago asking for help from across the campus. I'm really pleased to say that the Stem Cell Research Center was able to answer that call. We sourced all of the reagents and started production within a week period of time in order to supply that community testing need. And I just want to call out tonight a couple of people from the center um, who've been incredibly critical in that, um, particularly Christina Tu and Aliyah Fawaz, who are actually doing um, the synthesis and the sterility testing in order to coordinate with the UCI Department of Pathology and supply those um, reagents. But actually, it's all of our team, and I don't always show all of their pictures that enabled that, everything from purchasing to ordering to the deliveries that are really critical. And so I really just want to give a shout out um, to our team who has been just so amazing in these difficult times and keeping things up and running remotely as many businesses are having to do um, across the county and across the state. Another aspect um, of what we do as an academic uh, center is about partnering with the community and education and information. And so I wanted to highlight a couple of resources that um, and events that are coming up for those of you in the community. Um, one, which honestly I just found out about a day or two ago, is that there is a UC online high school program that has opened its doors to um, high school students across the state. This is free of charge. I encourage you to look it up and go there. Um, this is a great supplement to existing uh, curriculum, and there's a wide variety of courses that are all in online format that are offered. So something to take a look at that, again, the University of California is trying to support across the state. Upcoming also at the University of uh, California level, the Global Health Institute has a Global Health Day that's scheduled for May 2nd. If you're looking for something to tune into or just hear more about what those research efforts are um, across uh, the University of California system, this would be a great thing to have a look at. And then I wanted to highlight that hopefully we're going to be successful here with this event tonight. And our next um, regularly scheduled community lecture is on target for May 26th. That's Trauma, Brain Injury, and Epilepsy with Bobby Hunt and Lenny Groisman. And so hopefully you will all uh, be available to join us for that in this same format. We also have been working pretty feverishly over the last couple of weeks to put together a special event. And so I wanna take this opportunity to invite all of you to that, which will be Tuesday, May 14th, talking specifically about COVID-19 and um, some information in terms of general disease mechanisms dedicated towards the, the lay public, the lay level, to make it easy to understand for anyone who's interested in tuning in. And also talking about the efforts that are being made through the Alpha Stem Cell Research Clinic, looking ahead to clinical trials, looking ahead to bioethics and the sorts of things that are critical in terms of reopening society, um, and where we are in terms of the status of testing, which is gonna be a very important element of those efforts as we move forward, both within California and across the country. So our special uh, lecturers for that are all members of the Stem Cell Research Center. That'll be Ming Tang, Daniela Boda, Michelle Bratcher Goodwin, and Ed Manuki. So um, we'll have more about that coming out over the next couple of days. With that, I wanna again welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming tonight and um, kick off tonight's lecture, which is Next Generation Therapeutics and Diagnostics with Elliot Botvinnik, Professor of Biomedical Engineering here at UCI, and Bian Zhao, Associate Professor um, of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Biomedical Engineers, Engineering, both of whom are um, valued members of the Stem Cell Research Center. So with that, I'm gonna stop my screen share and let these guys take over. 
I would ask you just while they are going ahead and um, booting up, sorry, let me escape this. Um, two things. One is that um, while we do have a special event coming up to address COVID-19 and people's questions, we won't be taking questions on COVID-19 tonight. So I hope you'll come back for that opportunity. I know we've had a few that have come in on Facebook so far, and we'll be looking to address those um, over the next weeks. Um, and second, to hold your questions until the end, very similar to what we do in terms of a live format, so that both speakers have a chance to be able to complete their slides. And then we'll be um, moderating uh, the rest of the uh, questions that are coming in. They'll be feeding to me on our Zoom network. I'll repeat them to the speakers and we'll be answering them in the order that they come in. So with that, thanks again and take it away, you guys. Okay. Let's start. You guys see the size? Cool, oh, excellent. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anderson. Uh, I'm actually really excited to be part of this lecture series. Um, it's always important and fun to um, share the latest in science and research uh, with the public. Um, we, who really the people actually fund and support our research. So um, today I'm really gonna focus on cancer, which is something I think we can all relate to. Um, my grandfather, for example, um, he died of a liver cancer when he was only 52, um, just a few weeks before I was born. So I should never get a chance to meet with him. Um, so I wish um, he lived in this time as we might have a cure for him. Um, just, like, um, just, like, um, just like what happened you know, to Emily Whitehead. Um, Emily was, um, diagnosed with um, acute leukemia when he, so when she was only five. And um, by 2012, um, she ran out of all the options. Um, nothing really worked for her. Uh, her cancer was really advanced um, and at that point. Um, the cancer um, has invaded her bone, marrow, uh, liver, and spleen. Fortunately, uh, Emily was able to participate in a clinical trial at Children's Hospital of um, Philadelphia, led by Dr. Cardone and uh, his colleagues. Um, so Emily really became the first uh, pediatric patient to receive um, this engineered cell therapy called CAR T cells. And with just within a few weeks, uh, all her tumors uh, were gone and uh, she has become cancer free ever since. So um, this is a recent picture um, and she's now 14 years old. Um, I think this is really a beautiful uh, example of how science and research has led to transformation of people's lives. Um, and this is also what uh, really inspired and motivated us to get up and work hard every day because we know our research um, can really help people like Emily. Um, now, as we talk about um, this recent excitement um, in cancer therapy, I thought it's maybe useful to provide a historical context about the journey we've been on. Um, so first, I'd like to recommend two books. Um, the, the first one is um, The uh, Emperor of All Maladies, um, you know, which is really provide a biography of cancer from its first uh, you know, document appearance of a few thousand years ago um, to major breakthroughs um, you know, we had um, in terms of understanding um, the, the biology in terms of the and, and, and also the treatment um, in the 20th century. Um, the second book is even more optimistic. Um, it's called The Death of Cancer. So the author is Vincent um, DeVita, who has been a key uh, leading figure in the field. Um, so he explained why the war on cancer is winnable. And uh, so these two books both explain um, some of the key pillars of cancer therapy, with the first one being surgery. Uh, modern surgery became available in the late uh, 1800, um, and it worked really well for um, early stage cancer, uh, but not so well for advanced cancer, especially in metastasis. Uh, and then in 19, early 1900, uh, we started to use radiation therapy. Um, and then from the 1940s, um, the chemotherapy were uh, introduced as well. In fact, um, the first chemo was um, nitrogen mustard, um, you know, a poisoning gas used in the World War II. Um, so what happens was what um, people noticed the soldiers who were exposed to 
nitrogen master um, had their bone marrow um, all depleted. Um, so people thought maybe we can use that to reset the bone marrow to treat cancers, you know, like leukemia and lymphoma. You can't, so you kind of get a sense of some of the major limitations of uh, chemotherapy, and that is, you know, they can be very toxic, um, and they're often associated with very major side effects. Um, and the same is true also for radiotherapy as well. Um, since 2000, um, so we have added a few uh, more weapons in our, in our arsenal um, fighting with cancer. Um, so these are the drugs now um, that are more targeted to particular signaling pathways. Um, but, as, but as you can see, for centuries, we've been searching for a cure for cancer without much success uh, until now with the uh, immunotherapy. Um, and um, so, um, by, by, by harnessing the power of the immune system, um, you know, we have seen uh, amazing results, uh, you know, like Emily's. Um, so what is so different about immunotherapy that makes them uh, so powerful? Um, so first, the immune system has evolved with us for hundreds of millions of years. Um, so it really has the complexity that can match with the cancers. So um, at the center of the immune system is the T cells, um, a type of white blood cell um, that constantly conduct surveillance in our body um, to eliminate uh, pathogens such as virus and bacteria, as well as uh, transform cells. So much of what I would um, you know, talk about today is uh, you know, strategies we can use um, to enable T cells to see tumors better, kill tumors better. Um, now with respect to immunotherapy, T cells in particular, um, so they're smart, um, they're living medicines, um, they can sense and respond to biological information. Um, so they can target the tumors very specifically. Um, and therefore, so they hold the potential to be more efficacious and less harmful um, to normal tissue. And uh, so they can also migrate around the body. So that is very important to eradicate metastasis. Um, in addition, the immunity once developed can have long-term memory, um, you know, just like whole vaccine works. So they can prevent a cancer recurrence. And finally, for bioengineers like myself, um, immunotherapy is very attractive because they're modular and can be engineered and programmed to target a very wide range of diseases or conditions. Um, the first use of immunotherapy for cancer can actually be dated back 130 years ago. Um, in the early 90s, a bone surgeon called um, uh, Dr. William Coley, um, who actually treated a sarcoma patient, um, so he found something really interesting. Um, he observed that some cancer patients experienced spontaneous remission of their tumors when they got infected from a bacteria called um, Streptococcus. So he got this idea and uh, injected live bacteria into patients with malignant tumors. It, it was okay to do that sort of experiment 100 years ago. Um, but remarkably, uh, numerous of those patients uh, went on for long-term remission. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the patients lived on for another uh, 26 years and uh, eventually died from a heart attack. So at the time, Dr. Cody thought uh, the bacteria you know, are the ones that kill the tumors. Um, but now we know um, that is probably due to the immune system weakened by the infection. Um, Cody's approach uh, was largely dismissed at the time and partly because newer method um, you know, like a radiation therapy soon became the standard, um, but also because it's only recently we began to learn enough about uh, cancer and the immune system so we can effectively utilize immunotherapy for treating cancer. In fact, uh, cancer is very smart. Um, they have you know, evolved numerous ways to trick our immune system. Um, so as I said before, our immune system constantly con um, conduct surveillance um, and it would eliminate any abnormal cells um, and healthy conditions. But um, one trick uh, tumor used um, to deceive the T cells is actually by expressing molecules that our healthy normal cell used to uh, indicate itself. So this molecule um, here um, is called 
immune checkpoint proteins, um, such as PD-1, um, PD-L1, as an uh, example here. So what happens here, basically, the tumor cells tell the T cell, I'm a friend, um, so you should stop. Um, so now the tumor became invisible to the immune system, and the cancer is waning. So now as a therapeutic strategy, you can think of using inhibitors or antibodies um, to block the interaction between PD-1 and PD-L1. Um, and, and, and now you can release the breaks and unleash the T cells to kill tumor. Um, this approach has led to the FDA approval of um, APLIMAP in 2011. Um, that's really the first in the class. And now there's a few others um, antibody drugs has been approved as well. Um, it also led to a Nobel Prize in medicine um, to Dr. Allison and Dr. Hanjo in um, 2018 for their discoveries of two of the key immune checkpoint proteins, um, CTLA4 and the P, uh, uh, PD-1 respectively. Uh, and also for their effort in developing therapeutic strategies to target these molecules. Now, these medications are now available to treat a variety of cancer types and have helped uh, hundreds of thousands of patients. And in many cases, the patient is in long-term remission. Jimmy Carter, um, the former president, is one of them. Um, he received one of these medications for his uh, metastatic melanoma and has been cancer-free ever since. This is another uh, beautiful example of how science and the research has led to a drastic change uh, in one's life in a very positive way. Um, a documentary um, on Jimmy Allison's story uh, called Breakthrough uh, just came out recently. I watched, um, it's, it's very inspiring. Um, it not only told us science is the foundation to this success, but you have to dare um, to challenge the, you know, the status quo and uh, persevere be patient as well uh, when everybody else tells you what you do will not work. Um, so this is really uh, very inspiring to watch. Um, highly recommend to you. Um, in the example I just showed you, I talk about a therapeutic strategy where we give antibody drug to a person to unleash the T cells in his body to kill the tumor. Uh, now I want to discuss the alternative strategy where we can take the T cells outside the body and engineer them genetically uh, with a CAR molecule. Um, and this is a, um, an artificial receptor. And this artificial receptor is um, a chimera, a name derived uh, from hybrid uh, animals in ancient uh, mythology, um, because this molecule can bind both the tumor antigen binding motif, enabling the T cells to see the tumor cells, as well as um, activation signals um, to program uh, the T cells into a killing mode. And the two of these drugs um, have been approved by the FDA um, two years ago um, to treat B cell leukemia and lymphomas. Um, so the workflow for CAR T therapy started with uh, isolation of the T cells, um, and then you reprogram them with the CAR um, in the petri dish, and you can multiply them um, in the culture as well, and then you inject back uh, to the same patient. Now, once injected, CAR T's will be able to find and kill the tumor cells, and they can multiply and stay alive for many years in the body um, to prevent the cancer um, from um, um, recurrent. And uh, this is also the drug uh, Emily received. So one limitation of this approach is that each treatment can only be made and used for one patient. Um, so this patient specific nature means this process is very labor intensive. Um, it can take it for, you know, three, four weeks to manufacture um, and it make the treatment very expensive as well. So one way to address this issue um, is to use stem cells. I know many of you have attended the previous uh, stem cell lectures, um, you know, embryonic stem cells um, and uh, iPSCs have the power to become any cell types. Uh, including the T cells we talk about here. So there's very exciting work ongoing in the field to use stem cells to manufacture T cells in large numbers um, as allogeneic of the shelf drug so we can treat many patients. Um, I know you are all very excited now, uh, but I wanna make sure we're realistic as well. Um, there are still um, several major challenges remaining uh, before immunotherapy 
can be widely um, adopted in the clinic. Um, so first of all, I wish um, every cancer patient can be cured um, just like Emily. Um, but unfortunately, this type of immunotherapy is not available uh, or does not work well yet uh, for the majority of the patients, um, especially for those with solid tumor. Um, and this immunotherapy um, can still be associated with you know, major side effects um, because perturbing the immune system is always a fine balance. You want to, you know, uh, you want to be active to kill tumors, uh, but not overly reactive to produce a major cytokine storm or lead to autoimmune disorders. Um, and these treatments are very expensive too. Um, single injection of CAR T can cost half a million dollars, um, and those antibody treatments um, can cost ten, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars per year. Um, so we have to figure out, you know, who, you know, how we're going to pay that. Um, we attribute many of these challenges um, to the inefficiencies in the, um, in the conventional drug discovery uh, systems. Um, finding a effective and safe immunotherapy from a very large library um, is like finding a needle um, in a haystack. So the conventional method um, still largely rely on a tr um, trial and error approach, which is a very tedious, um, very time consuming and, and expensive. Um, so in order to accelerate um, the development of immunotherapy um, and lower their cost in my laboratory, um, so we have developed a new strategy, uh, which is really inspired uh, by this natural T cell binding and tumor cating function at a single cell level. Um, but what we can do um, is um, by using a lab on a chip uh, system we developed, uh, we can interrogate um, tens of millions of this type of emu and cancer cell interactions in a single experiment. Um, so this really enable us to efficiently survey a very large pool of emu repertoire and identify um, those low abundance therapeutic elite that um, exhibit optimal uh, anti-tumor um, efficacy and safety profiles. And because we can do this so efficiently, it, it can uh, significantly reduce the time and the cost as well in order to develop a new drug. Um, so we're really determined um, because we envision a, a world where each, uh, each cancer patient, regardless of their cancer type and stage, will have immunotherapeutics so, they, uh, so that they do not have to say goodbye to their loved ones too soon. Um, I know I speak for my lab members, um, as well as Emberstone Biosciences, a startup a company I co-founded. Um, so you heard earlier um, um, that you know, you know, one thing we have been really focused on doing in the stem cell research center uh, is to translate uh, findings from the laboratory to the clinic to help people. And uh, one way to do this effectively is to work with the industry um, and sometimes to start our own companies. Uh, in my lab, uh, it is common that um, you know, a graduate student or a postdoc who work on a new technology um, and when they finish training in the lab, um, they go on you know, working in the companies that we formed. Um, so they're so passionate about what they do, um, are really determined to take it all the way to the market. Um, I also feel enormously fortunate to work here at UCI. Um, you know, I'm sure Dr. Bobnick will tell you more about it, but UCI is one of the best in the country in terms of innovation, entrepreneurship, and really providing us with exceptional environment and resources to um, succeed in this front. Um, at Emberstone, we already have a big and a strong team. Um, I thought my labs are working pretty hard, but these people in the company, they do not stop um, because they are really um, on a mission. Um, well, occasionally, um, so they have some fun as well. Um, so this was from a beach party uh, we had last summer, um, really amazing people. And um, I've been learning a lot from them. Uh, again, so I, I, you know, I speak to you today on behalf of my lab members as well. Um, so they're really the ones who did all the work. Um, so in my lab, uh, we have trained over 100 uh, postdocs, um, graduate student and undergrad. But one group uh, I'm so proud of in particular is our high school interns. Um, so the most frustrating aspect of being a professor uh, is to be able to work with young people like these ones. Um, so one thing I have now realized also is that um, so they are so, so much smarter than I am. Um, they know so much more than I did at their age. Um, so it's you know, really comforting to know the future is in good hands. 
Finally, I just want to share some information and uh, resources that you might find useful. Uh, although I'm not a physician, I got emails, phone calls uh, all the time from patients and their family members asking, um, you know, what therapies are available for them. Um, so this free website um, called Drug Bank has a, a very comprehensive list of drugs and ther therapeutics, including some of the most recent ones. Um, it also offers extensive information um, about the drug and their uh, mechanism of action. So you can search um, by the name of the drug or by the indication. So you can also search uh, clinical trial, uh, trust.gov for ongoing clinical studies um, on a wide range of the diseases um, and conditions. You can learn uh, what's upcoming in the pipeline. Um, and if you're eligible, you might be able to uh, participate in these studies as well. Um, with that, I just want to thank you for, um, for tuning in today. I know it has not been uh, easy uh, for everybody um, due to COVID-19 situation. Um, but if we unite um, and uh, show love and support to each other, um, I think we're going to win this soon. Um, thank you again. So i um, happy to address any questions um, in the end. Thank you. So I'll just jump in for a second, Vian. Thank you so much. Again, we're going to hold questions until um, the very, very end. So I'm going to invite Elliot now to queue up his slides and um, be ready to go with his part of the presentation. OK. Thank you. Uh, Wayne, it's always such a pleasure to hear you talk. Thank you. I'm assuming you guys can all hear me. Um, if you give me a minute, I'm going to run over to the Gross, Gross Hall. OK, thank you. All right, this is a more appropriate venue for my talk. So thank you for tuning in. And thank you, uh, Director Anderson, for inviting me to give a talk. I'm very, very flattered you would consider me. Um, I'm on the Faculty of Biomedical Engineering and Surgery um, at the Beckman Laser Institute, and I currently serve as the Associate Director for the Edwards Life Sciences Cardiovascular Center. Uh, before I start, I'm not going to discuss stem cells, but some of my talk is related to diabetes, and I just want to remind you that our stem cell center has two world leaders in cell therapies in the treatment of type 1 diabetes. And uh, shoot me an email if you want to be made, put in contact with these two. In fact, right now, UC Irvine, under uh, Dr. Wong's uh, directorship, is conducting a safety study of this little pouch that houses stem cells to try to treat diabetes. It's very exciting work. I just want to quickly bring up my laboratory. As Dr. Zhao mentioned, these are the people who do all the work. Uh, I have postdocs and uh, PhD students and undergraduates, and I do want to mention two of my undergrads, oops, just recently got upgraded and are staying for their PhD. We call ourselves the Beams Lab. I don't know why, but we just like the name. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is work done by this group of people. So we have a number of doctors, uh, undergraduates, graduate students, and Dr. Weidling in the upper left is my partner in crime. He more or less co-directs the lab with me. So thank you, John. I wanted to begin with something unrelated to my research at all, but relevant to the times. I am disturbed and always surprised at misinformation, especially when everyone's lives are at risk. And I just want to share with you a possible way to deal with misinformation. And it comes down to this unexpected question I received. I was in uh, DC at the National Science Foundation there to review grant proposals. So the way it works is we sit around a table and we look at people's proposals and you know, we consider the science and the question and the impact of their question and it's very civil. And we come up with a recommendation that perhaps you should award a grant to this person. It's very rigorous uh, and we all have the mission of trying to help the world. So I arrived the night before at the hotel by the NSF headquarters and because I'm me, I wanted to get a beer. So, I promise you it was just one beer. And I was sitting with um, some other uh, residents, I guess. And the bartender asked me a question I've never thought of before. 
And this question is, or was, what does it mean to be a scientist? And I never actually thought that way. I never thought of this question. I'll tell you what I answered, which I told him, a scientist spends 90% of their time, effort, and thoughts trying to prove their ideas wrong. Okay, we spend all, actually the vast majority of our time trying to come up with experiments to prove our notions wrong. And in my opinion, that's what defines us. And I'm very proud to be a scientist and it makes me proud to be associated with stem cell center scientists who really live by this philosophy. And what you're gonna find is Mr. Know-it-all is gonna spew ideas at you that sound very scientific. And it could be whether the earth is flat. It could be whether a measles vaccine is poison. And I can't believe it. It could be whether or not man and dinosaur coexisted, all right? And my advice to you is to ask yourself, how much time do they spend trying to prove themselves wrong? Not right. And my rule of thumb is if they haven't spent at least 50% of that time, and I'll ask them, how much time do you spend disproving your ideas? The conversation is kind of over. And that's my advice to you. Find someone who always questions their ideas. Anyway, so on to the talk. So what I want to talk about today is an example of how our lab, a bioengineering lab, identified a need, came up with an idea, invented a, a device, and then tested it in the clinic. And I hope you'll find this fun because there's just hundreds of hours of really exciting work. The following slide is not real, it's dramatization. So the way this project started is the military, the, the uh, combat casualty care director, came to my institute and asked, can you please make us a continuous lactate monitor? And so lactate or lactic acid is the molecule we think about as making our muscles sore when we exercise too hard. That's not actually true, but it is a molecule that gets produced when you become very anaerobic, you work out very hard. And it turns out its elevated levels are um, correlate with survivability and helps identify which subjects or which patients should be treated first. Right? And it turns out there's a number of other indicators, CO2 in the blood, uh, oxygen in the blood, glucose sometimes, uh, different salts. And in a hospital, your blood gets drawn and sent down to the lab and it can take hours to get the results back. And sometimes in critical medicine, an hour is too long. So we just asked our lab, we, got, we came together and said, why can't you just schlep the lab wherever you go? So we said, all right, let's take a hospital lab and shrink it down into the skin. So here's a rendering of our original idea, which is to have this little quarter size flexi thingy on your skin and a fiber that goes under the skin that's several hairs wide. And when you zoom in, we just want a bunch of little pads. We're being abstract. Each pad will measure a different chemical in the body. And then wi just wirelessly transmit the idea, uh, the data, excuse me, to the physicians, clinicians, nurses continuously. Like, wouldn't this be awesome? So it said, wow, you know, we, then we, we spoke to ICU doctors, we hit the literature, uh, we asked what should be measured. And so we came up with a really comprehensive list. Okay, pH, temperature, sodium, potassium, chloride. And we, we, came, to re, we came to realize you can't put 100 different measurements in one strip. So we decided to kind of stratify what can we invent? How can we make these tiny fibers? Each one has a different set of pads on it that measure, measures different chemicals. So for example, for the military application, I think our little strip could be good for critical care, emergency medicine, and military, and that's a set of analytes you'd want to measure. Okay. Now, what we're going to focus on is actually diabetes, type 1 diabetes in particular, and I'd like to give you a background of our invention. So here's a common question the parents will have. Their young child is playing soccer. It's 95 degrees Fahrenheit, nice hot summer day. They've been playing for an hour. Kid comes off the field. Kid has type 1 diabetes. Should you give them an orange or should you give them an injection of insulin? You can't choose wrong. It can, it can be life and death. Well, let's take a look at some symptoms. Being very thirsty is a sign of high glucose in your blood. Well, exercise makes you thirsty. 
glucose high or low what makes you very hungry. Exercise makes you hungry. You sweaty is a sign of being low sugar or high sugar. It also means you've been exercising in 95 degree temperatures and you get the idea. Being weak and tired is not specific either. So how do you make this important decision? Well, fortunately, there are on the market devices that are nothing less than wonderful. Okay, in the top left, these sensors are much smaller now and they get inserted not by hand, but you can put a little fiber under the skin that measures glucose continuously. Excellent technology. You can also wear it looks like a pager. It's a pump that pumps insulin through a tube into the skin, gets into the blood. So using these kind of devices, people close the loop, so to speak, and control of the sugar is actually pretty darn good, up to about 75% of the time. Okay? The other percent of the time is still quite life-threatening and we're stuck. Using glucose alone isn't enough to get 100% automated control of the blood sugar. So there's a call to create additional signals and let me motivate one for you. I'm gonna show you some data here. A red circle means blood sugar is above 10. It's very high, high level. You gotta treat it with insulin. Green, blood sugar is around five, it's great. Yellow, blood sugar is below five. You're actually in acute danger of passing out, going uh, into a coma or death. So then there was an exercise study done where you can see this black marker, this black dot. This is, think of it as spin class, okay? It's interval high intensity exercise. And these little white circles, uh, 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 hollow circles, think of it as, you know, cruising around your bike and occasionally sprinting up a curb and then cruising around again. And subjects came in for this study, okay? The x-axis is in time. The y-axis is how much did your blood sugar change, okay? So the subjects come in, they exercise for 30 minutes, the black dots spin class, white dots cruising around the neighborhood, then it stops and the subjects rest and your sugar gets monitored, your blood glucose gets monitored. Now, when the subjects started the study, their actual blood value was 11, they're high. And you can see as they go through the exercise phase, both spin class and beach cruisers, they drop, the sugar drops, okay? But what's important is at the end of the exercise phase, they both still have high blood sugar. So how much insulin should you administer? And insulin can take up to 90 minutes to be fully effective. How much insulin should you deliver so that you normalize the sugar later without causing a dangerous low? Well, it turns out after the rest period, the subjects on the beach cruiser were actually pretty good in sugar, okay? And the subjects with the spin class needed more insulin. This is so counterintuitive. It's saying the harder these people worked out, okay, the higher their blood sugar stayed. It didn't go down, it stayed high when they worked out more. Very confusing. So can we look at signals during the exercise and after to try to predict, should these subjects receive insulin and how much? Heart rate, seems to go, we look during exercise, heart rate is elevated in black during intense exercise. But everything makes your heart rate change, especially when you're a neurotic scientist like I am, it's not reliable. But blood lactate, the lactic acid in your body looks really specific okay, when, to how hard you're exercising. You can see the elevated signals in spin class versus beach cruising. And so this kind of data, captured by other scientists, inspired us to try to make a continuous lactate marker. In fact, there's a general consensus in the literature, and here's a great article that says, when you do aerobic exercise, your sugar will tend down. When you do really anaerobic exercise, it tends up. Most people exercise in the middle. What the heck should they do? We want to help them. So time to invent a technology. What we decided to do was use our understanding of light. Okay? In fact, light through the skin. So as it turns out, if you look at the graph on the right, just pay attention to that graph, the x-axis is wavelength or white color, uh, light color. The left side of the graph is red and it becomes invisible as you move to the right. There's this narrow band in blue, okay? Narrow band of wavelengths that will allow light to pass through the skin, through skin pigments, through blood vessels, et cetera, through the water of the skin, okay? So what we figured out is if we can make little pads emit light, and that light is specific to a concentration of one analyte, we can just put a bunch of pads in a row. And as long as we activate them, activate them one at a time, they can all share the same spectral window, allowing us to measure multiple, multiple analytes. This is what one looks like. Okay, this is an older version. And uh, you see the three LEDs in yellow on top of a little flexible fiber. 
And a quick video of John assembling this device under the microscope using the tip of a needle, tweezers, and no caffeine in his body. And there you go, it's made by hand. It's kind of ugly, but this has been in the clinic and it works pretty darn well. Our current version is half as thick as this thing, okay? It's the size of three hairs. So what is that green film? It's so simple, it's beautifully elegant. We take a biocompatible membrane that looks like spaghetti when you zoom in, okay? Then we coat all of the strands of spaghetti with a dye that responds to oxygen. And then we fill all the pores of the bowl of spaghetti with a goo that contains this enzyme called lactate oxidase. And the chemistry is simple. We have little Pac-Men inside, inside of our film and they eat lactic acid that I wanna measure and they eat oxygen and what's left is less oxygen. So we take a light emitting diode in red, just like you have on your phone. We slap on top of it this membrane that has Pac-Man in it. We pump in a red light, the membrane gives off infrared light and we measure that light and we can tell you how much concentration you have of X, Y, or Z. Okay. And what I like about this dye is it's slow, okay? When you think of fluorescence, you shine light onto a molecule, it gives off a different wavelength, okay? like blue light in, green light out. That happens so quickly, okay? in nanoseconds, it happens in the billions of the seconds. I can't design electronics to capture that event that you can wear in the skin. But these molecules we use, when they bind oxygen, they give off a phosphorescence. It's really slow. It's in millionths of a second is how long it takes. And I can measure that with about $5 worth of electronics. And what we do is if you just look at the solid red line, in time, we turn the LED on and then we just turn it off. But these molecules, since they're slow and lazy, they continue to emit the light even after my LEDs turned off, okay? And I can fit this functional form to that decay and come out with tau. It's just a time constant. It says, how lazy is this light, okay? And then I can relate that light lazy factor to how much oxygen there is. It's actually quite straightforward. And for those of the engineers in the audience, we do a calibration at different oxygen levels. I realize now this is probably a pretty boring slide. <laughs> and what we end up on the right is the following. If I measure how lazy the light is at any point in time, I can measure exactly how much oxygen there is since I know about Pac-Man, I can measure how much lactic acid there is in the body. So light in, light out, how lazy is the light, how much oxygen there is, I can measure a lactate and report it to the patient or the clinician. So what we did next is we set out to make these things. It was actually incredibly difficult. So we made our flex fibers, okay, our little flexible circuits, and decided to make a lactate sensor first. Our current design is about one half the width or smaller of a number two pencil leg. That's what this is sitting on top of, this is dying. And then we assemble this little device for punching it through green skin, putting the device under the skin and this electronic recorder plugs in. So we took this into the clinic for an exercise study. In fact, for a spin class type exercise study. We did the study with people who have type one diabetes in Melbourne, Australia with David O'Neill's group in Toronto, Canada with Michael Rydell's group and with Shlamit Asics group here at UCI. We have currently, so here's, uh, if you look at the table, we have done six subjects so far at UCI. We've done 41 subjects internationally and we're still waiting for the blood standards to come back before we can evaluate how, our, how well our sensor works. And we're planning to do 12 patients here where we measure both glucose and lactic acid to answer the orange or insulin question. Here's some of our data we're pretty excited about. So you can see here, the height of each bar is how difficult the pedaling is. Okay? Each red dot is draw, the nurse draws blood and we send it to the lab for analysis. And each black dot, dot is our sensor reporting a number. It tracks really well. In fact, here's beautiful data. I don't think anyone's ever seen this kind of data before, where someone's cycling and with each pink bar in time, they're pedaling really hard for a couple of minutes, then they relax and they pedal really hard. You can see the body clears lactic acid after the first bout. Then it begins to build up and build up as they keep exercising more difficultly, uh, excuse me, with, uh, more strenuously until it clears. And we think there's information in the shape of these waveforms that will tell us blood sugar three hours later. And that's the point of our upcoming study. And just to show you, our device is working pretty darn well. 
There was a hundred things wrong with it. I, uh, if you want to talk about that, let's get a cup of coffee, but we're working on making it perfect. And now we're to our end goal, and I'm going to wrap up my talk in just a minute here. We have now designed a version of this that measures glucose, oxygen, and lactate simultaneously. These are clinic ready. We're ready to go into studies. Okay. We've gone onto the bench top and we've shown in orange and yellow that we can measure lactic acid changes in a solution and we can measure glucose changes in a solution independently from each other, which is incredibly non-trivial, at least for us, it's hard. And now we can finally do the study to test our hypothesis, which is continuous blood lactate signals can predict glucose values or trends in the hours after exercise. Because if you can do that, you can decide whether to eat or to administer insulin throughout the day and allow exercise to come back into your life when you're suffering from this disease. Our study is simple. Subjects will come in for an intense, medium, and moderate exercise day. They're gonna do uh, bicycle studies during the gray bar. This is time on the x-axis. And we're simply gonna track in red the blood lactate concentrations and see if we can predict which of these blue paths blood glucose takes hours later. If it turns out this predictive power, we're gonna contact the insulin pump manufacturers okay, to see if they can integrate our sensing technology into their artificial pancreases. Unfortunately, we were just about to start this study about one week after the COVID-19 pandemic shut down the campus. So I can't show you the results of that study, but I can tell you we're really ready for it. And so in summary, uh, I have shown you how we've identified a need as engineers, just conceptualize what should this thing even look like before we invented it. Then we came up with an invention and ultimately deployed it into the clinic. What's, up, what's happening next? Uh, we're actually submitting a proposal and have neat data that we're gonna add ketones. If anyone here in the audience lives with diabetes, you'll have glucose, lactic acid, and ketones continuously in one thin fiber. And working with Professor Weiss, Greg Weiss in chemistry, we're working on insulin sensing, and that would be added to the same device. And I just want to take a minute to thank our donors um, and our funding agencies. It never ceases to, me, to amaze me at how generous donors are. And the impact of your donations on science cannot be overstated. I am deeply, deeply grateful to you. And I thank you for your time. And thank you, Director Anderson, for allowing me to talk. So um, thank you so much to both of you, Vian and Elliot, for um, coming tonight and having a chat. I think we need to give a few minutes to see if we have any questions come in from our online audience. Um, but I think I can kick off with one. Elliot, I, I loved your analogy um, in terms of what scientists do and how we think about things. This is something um, that really is, <laughs> there's Cameron. <laughs> that really is, um, I think, accurate as a distinction. And I love the way that you set that up. But uh, that ghost that you saw over my shoulder a moment ago asked the follow-up question and said, what do we do with our other 10% of our time? And so that's an interesting question, maybe. I, th I suspect we have a fair number of high school students um, in the audience. And uh, it might be interesting just to say a little bit about going down the very translational path that you both have done, where disproving your hypothesis is such a central part of being a scientist. How do you make that work on the translational course? Where are you spending that other 10% of your time in order to follow that pipeline down the path? Hmm. Uh, well, a lot of the 10% of the time is in Zoom meetings, as it turns out. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a hard, there's a lot of boring, parts of translational medicine that I'm, I'm almost reluctant to talk about. And quality assurance, keeping the documents, doing tests. And this is actually, I have one great answer for you. Is when we conduct tests, you have an independent person test your device and you have an independent group come up with a statistical plan for how to test your device. Those are the two ways in which questioning yourself 90% of the time can manifest themselves in translational medicine like we do. 
So um, for me, Dr. Anderson, I think, you know, 10%. So I, I kind of want to address your question from a very different angle, right? So I spent a lot of time, uh, more than 10%, uh, actually, to um, just look for good people um, to work with, you know, both for collaboration, but also to really bring on the team to um, to work on this project. You know, I, I find that's a very important aspect uh, for the success, you know, both for translational work, but also for business science as well, just to be able to identify those people. Um, you know, that's why we spend a lot of time, um, you know, we try to nurture them from very early on. So, you know, you, you saw this high school student um, you talk about as well. I think, you know, so that's, you know, something really important we spend a lot of time working on. Ali, we can't hear you if you're talking to us. Sorry, I got bounced out into mute and I'm not sure why. So I have one question that's come in. So um, that would go to um, the two of you. Um, and that's to hear from uh, the, the you guys as presenters, how the COVID-19 pandemic has altered your work. Is everything on hold? Is the lab losing money? Where do, these, where do things stand in terms of being able to take things along the translational pipeline that you're trying to do? Um, Elliot commented on it briefly, but maybe if both of you could talk a little bit just about, you know, sort of day-to-day -day lab operations and maybe a little bit about the big picture of where we all stand right now in terms of looking forward over the next 12 to 24 months, because we're all struggling with that um, a little bit going forward. So um, Elliot, why don't you lead off? Um, yeah, so our, our lab right now is inactive. Okay, so what we've done is we've transitioned to thinking and reading and learning. Um, in fact, I'm taking an online uh, linear algebra class right now. And, and, but, and so we're planning what to do when the lab reopens, but really right now we're focusing on what, everything we can do offline in terms of getting ready for the next push. But I would say that Professor Bernard Choi and I, who's at the Beckman Laser Institute, we decided to build a, an emergency ventilation system out of CPAP machines. It took us about three weeks and it works beautifully. I think we're handing it off to the next level of people to make the engineering look clean. So, that's I'm not sure I answered your question, but that, that's what we've been doing. No, I, I think that's great. Um, Mian. So for my lab, um, so of course, you know, we're not working in the, in the lab on the bench. Um, but I have to say, you know, this is probably the most productive period um, for my lab in the past, you know, you know eight and a half years. Um, because we are able to, you know, you know, sit, you know, sit, um, you know, just, just write, um, write papers. Um, there, there has been lots of papers overdue. Um, you know, on the normal time, you know, people are distracted by by working on the bench. Um, but but now everybody really can focus on their writing. Uh, we submitted a few papers already. Um, you know, I think that's you know really exciting. But at the same time, um, so my um, team, uh, so we've been kind of uh, developing rapid testing uh, as well as therapeutics as well for COVID nineteen. Um, so for um, you know, especially my companies, you know, so they still open, so they work, um, I kind of, you know, help them along, you know, as well. So I'd be very happy to talk about this subject, you know, there's something really exciting. That's fantastic. Great answers from both of you. I, I guess I'll, I'll just say for, for my lab, it was asking about the three of us. I think we're all in kind of the same situation of, um, it's a challenging time for our graduate students and postdocs who really depend upon being in the lab and getting data out. Um, but as Vian highlighted, um, there are, you know, some other sides to that. Many of us have turned to look for COVID-19 related projects that are really relevant. We actually are launching a set of studies to um, look at how um, SARS-2 coronavirus might be neurotropic and affect things like neural stem cells. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the stories that you two highlighted in terms of, you know, ventilator synthesis and sensors are like incredible examples of where academic institutions are really, really important, even in situations like this. And it is critical to be able to investigate new areas and pivot your research in that direction. That said, graduate students and postdocs are in a rough spot in general because their dissertation, their work, their next steps are really on hold. And so to whoever the person is who asked that question, it's a, it's a challenging time, but we're also very, very fortunate. And I think most of us um, recognize that. We have a, a follow-up question that's come in. 
Um, and I think that um, this must be to Elliot. Um, did you say that your device could be used for other conditions by moderate, monitoring other sets of body chemicals? And so maybe just say um, a few words on the sorts of initial examples you highlighted in terms of being able to customize this device design. Yeah, I think that maybe the, the best answer is we need more people. So if you're interested, shoot out, uh, reach out to me. The way we would do this is once we understand the condition we want to monitor, we would ask ourselves what analytes can actually improve care by knowing them continuously. So that's the first question you ask. And then what you ask, or we would ask is what chemistries exist to allow us to detect the presence of that molecule? Do we need to invent one or can we take advantage of something that's published or even better, can we work with someone who knows how to do it? And then it's a matter of miniaturization and chemistry and chemical engineering to put the material, these chemicals into the film and create a new strip. It's a fun process and we would love, it's a great opportunity for education. I'm not sure how old the person is who asked the question. There's a lot of learning involved, but that is our general process. So identify the need, what signals have value to be, me to be measured continuously and then how do we put those set of signals onto a new strip? And I think maybe I'll just chime in and say quickly, I, I think that's a great um, example of how the relationship between biology and engineering works, that um, it's one way that you really get to effective translation and effective implementation of devices, because you really have to do this combined effort of looking for a need and understanding what that need is and then doing the basic science, building up, how can you devise a sensor like that? How does the, how does, in surprising ways, how does it happen that your blood glucose has changed by exercise? And so oftentimes out of that back and forth process really is where you're advancing both the basic science and the translational applications at the same time um, in parallel. So I, I think it's really a terrific example. Um, Maybe, I, so I have another couple of questions coming in here. Can I pivot to beyond for just one second? Um, one of them uh, is, I think um, I'm parsing a little bit. Um, in terms of cancer therapies that are coming along, how has um, stem cell research um, impacted things like CAR T cells, mm -hmm. um, or for example, NK cells as immunotherapies are moving forward. And so maybe just say a few words about that so that we come full circle here in terms of um, our audience understanding those connections. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, um, you know, very exciting um, ongoing work. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I just had a few lines on my slides, you know, I could not really elaborate you know, on that topic. Um, but, you know, I think because, um, you know, one of the challenges, you know, to make T-cells, um, you know, like I mentioned on the slides right now is, you know, you have to make for one person, right? You know, take a few weeks, you know, very expensive, you know, just, you know, for that one person um, and, and um, very time consuming as well. But um, so if you think about using stem cells, right, you know, iPSCs and, you know, embryonic stem cells, you can really uh, manufacture, um, you know, T-cells or other, you know, kind of immunotherapy, you know, like you mentioned, um, you know, NK cells, you know, very large quantity, right? So you can really scale up, you know, that process. Um, in addition, one thing people do is actually, uh, you know, really make that, you know, allogeneic, you know, meaning that you can take that as off the shelf drug. Um, you can treat, so you can isolate, you know, cells from a donor, healthy donor, but then you can manufacture, you know, um, hundreds of hundreds of dosages, you know, to treat many, many patients. Um, so that's a huge, uh, a investment, I think, in a huge breakthrough, you know, if that happens, right, so we're going to see a transformation, whole stem cell, um, you know, whole stem cell technology can really advance uh, immunotherapeutics um, and, and, and for cancer and other disorders. Um, it's just because, you know, stem cells are kind of high, you know, you know, you know the high on the, on the tree, right, it can really become any other cells, and you know, that has that huge advantage. Yep, that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, Elliot, I have one more that pivots back to you. This is from Franz Klevitz. Apologies if I got that wrong. Thank you so much. I was wondering how you determined where to place the sensor. Are there different places that might be better? Um, and do lacto lactase, lactose, glucose levels vary depending upon that location? Um, and uh, a parallel question to that, how are you able to measure the accuracy of your sensors? Can you explain how that process works in terms of value? Yes. Uh, oh, it's a great question. So I can tell you where we've placed it. 
which I call the posterior lateral love handle. So they can take place basically right here, primarily because that's where it was compatible with exercise on a bike. And that's, that's where they, um, um, the, the IRB kind of approved its placement. But for glucose, there's a lot of evidence in the diabetes world. There's different places you can, play, you can place them, you know, where I just showed on the arm. And there's no doubt the tissue or the skin there will have different dynamics with the blood. To my understanding, at least in glucose, the dynamics don't vary so much that it can affect your uh, closing the loop. That is a speculation. I don't have hard data on that. For lactate, no one actually knows. So for a really grim application like injured soldiers, this is horrible to think about, but you can't actually plan on which skin is available, okay? So if you optimize it for the arm, you may not have access to the arm. It's just horrible, okay? So for the purposes of a type one diabetes, we would conduct the study to place the sensor in places that patients or wearers would likely wear them. So I can't answer your lactic acid question yet until we do more studies. It is an excellent question and on my list of what to question myself about. Well, that's, that's part of my diabetes. You have a good question. Yeah, sorry, that was a really good question. <laughs> and the way, the way we test them, just to be brief, but we, we, we have venous blood draws and we use a, a standard instrument called a YSI analyzer or ISTAT to get the blood reference. Right, perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> Another question that's come in is, can some version of this lab on a chip technology be used to detect COVID-19? What are the potential applications? Um, I think that would really, well, yeah. What are the potential applications in that regard? Yeah, well, I mean, the answer is yes. Um, so like I mentioned, we have an uh, uh, ongoing project. Um, so using some of those technologies. Um, so in one form, we actually, um, you know, in collaboration with Dr. Phil Fellner. Um, so using his mockery technology, uh, you know, where they print a lot of antigens for COVID-19. Um, so we can do very high, you know, very um, high throughput, but also highly multiplexable um, serology um, testing for antibodies, you know, in the blood, right? So, you know, to really kind of understand the penetrance of um, the infection um, and really get people back to work. Um, so that's really ongoing. Um, so, so that's actually, um, you know, almost ready to um, deploy you know, a very large scale. Um, that's something really, really exciting. Um, and the other, um, you know, single cell analysis I talk about. Um, so, you know, we have ongoing project now to uh, analyze, you know, B cells from this recovered patient and to really discover super neutralizing antibodies uh, for COVID-19. So both projects are very exciting. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm very shy to ask for help, but I think if anybody um, who um, are interested in being involved in those studies and help our research, um, you know, do let me know. Fantastic. That is great. So um, we're at about 10 after eight right now. You guys did just a wonderful job of, of being on time. I'm just looking to see if we have any other questions that have come in. Um, and we don't right now. I want to take a minute to give people to just shoot in any other questions that they might have. And um, remind the audience that we do have, if, if I may, that we have this upcoming special event Thursday, May 14th, where we're gonna be talking about um, COVID-19 related questions and work Ming Tan from the Microbiology and Molecular Genetics Department and Center for Virus Research is gonna be giving an introduction on SARS-2 and COVID-19. Daniela Boda, our ASCC Director and the Associate Dean of Clinical Research here at UCI, is going to be talking about the COVID-19 clinical trial landscape, including some of the things that are queuing up through the Alpha Stem Cell Center here. Michelle Bratcher Goodwin, Chancellor's Professor in the School of Law and also a member of the Stem Cell Research Center, is going to be talking about bioethics and how that relates to the decisions that are made around uh, reopening society ending or altering social distancing as we move forward in this pandemic. And Ed Manuki, who's professor and chair in the UCI pathology department is gonna talk about the current status of testing for COVID-19. And I knew I was gonna kill enough time for this to work. Um, here we go, we have a question from Amy Jordan. Dr. Botvinnik, do you think these sensors are something that someday people could use in everyday life to monitor their own biochemistry? maybe even get one over the counter to hack their diets, alter their exercise program. And where can they monitor their ex their levels of these chemicals? Oh, could you use, could you integrate that with a smartphone in order to make choices that are lifestyle choices? Okay, well, thank you for the question, Dr. Jordan. Um, 
Well, yes, eventually we would like this to be over the counter. One of the analytes we're working on is to measure ketones for um, looking at high blood sugar, but actually it's great for detecting if you're burning fat. You know, I wore a continuous glucose monitor, a commercial one for two weeks. And I was really stunned by how my body processes sugar. In fact, I think everyone over the age of 40 should wear one of these. And I think as we allow people to understand how their body processes food, there can be diets prescribed that we never even imagined. So yes, I hope, that, I hope this could be over the counter and really give people that people are used to data now. Give them the data they need to improve their lives. That is definitely our goal. And talking to the iPhone, it's already, we already do that. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. It's need electrical <laughs> engineer in a locked door. I'm not really so sure that I want to know how chocolate is affecting me though, because it's important for other reasons for my mental stability. So <laughs> you need a psychiatrist for that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a follow-up um, um, from Hike in the Stem Cell Center, and this is for Vayan. What is your thinking regarding vaccine approval of COVID-19 or for COVID-19? Is it possible to have success in a short period of time? Um, without any preclinical improvements. And I, I think what he means by this is in terms of um, uh, maybe going forward with a limit, limited set of preclinical testing. Um, again, just to point out, you know, in two weeks, I guess we'll have something that's much more focused with some real experts in terms of virology research that'll be here. But beyond if there's a piece of that that you feel like you can feel, have at it. Yeah, so, um, you, you know, I think for COVID-19, the vaccine development, um, you know, we just, you know, really take, you know, unparalleled approach and pace um, in terms of the vaccine development, you know, something we've never seen before. Um, and right now, there's already a number of vaccines being tested um, in clinical trials. Um, but just to uh, understand, and that will take a few months at least, uh, because we want to make sure uh, first of all, they're safe, right? And also they're efficacious as well. So each of these phases actually take a few months. Um, and the, the reason why we do this is because, um, you know, for vaccines, we tend to deploy them to a, a very large population. We want to make sure there's nothing wrong, uh, you know, going to happen, you know, for people. Um, so, um, so that's kind of the current standards. Um, but for therapeutics, uh, right, if you only give, you know, patients a few times, um, and there's, uh, you, you know, a number of those are ongoing as well. And hopefully some of those will be, um, you, you know, showing efficacy and get approved, you know, even before the vaccines. Yep, that was great. And I, I suspect maybe I'll just add um, one piece on that. I, I think that question may have come from some reports in the media about vaccines going into production before clinical testing. And I think Dion's point is exactly right. Even if they go into production, that just means gearing up. It doesn't mean that there won't be any safety testing that's done, because, that's done because that's a really, really important element. We wouldn't want to deploy a potential vaccine into a large segment of the population without safety testing. I don't think it would roll out that way. Yeah, I would add um, it doesn't make sense to safety test something that hasn't been shown to be mass producible either because it could change in the effort to make it mass producible. Yep. Although, vaccine production technologies have come pretty far over the last 10 or 20 years. So it is a bit of a different game um, than it might have been well, in our last pandemic some time ago. Um, we have a question again for Vian. Is it, uh, this is from Seema Baldwin. Um, Dr. Zhao, is it true that if you fast over 24 hours, your body starts making new stem cells based on your body's needs? Actually, I think that could go probably to, to both of you, it's gonna depend what kind of stem cell we're talking about. So Vian, why don't you start? And then Elliot, if you wanna chime in. Well, you know, if it's okay, Dr. Anderson, I'll, I'll defer that to you actually. <laughs> 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 but no. a very tricky question. Um, I, I just, I do feel you're much better equipped than me to, to address that. I agree. Wow. Um, <laughs> I think that it is a complicated question. It's going to depend what kind of stem cell you're talking about. So without going too far out on a limb, um, I think that stem cells that are in your body in a normal niche are always listening to cues in the environment. And those cues tell them when to ramp up and ramp down. So in terms of a great example would be like skin stem cells and wound healing. Max Plekis from the center gave a lecture on this earlier in the year. Um, and it's a really classical example of how cells listen to the niche because you have to activate that stem cell population in order to heal a cut 
for example. And so, of course, there are going to be conditions that are going to activate them. Neural stem cells, which is my area um, in the central nervous system, are really, really important um, for learning and memory, for maintaining uh, uh, brain function in, well, and they're very responsive to the environment also. They get activated by exercise, as an example. And so you can actually make more neural stem cells by virtue of being active. And that's because there are cues that go from the peripheral system, the rest of your body into your brain, tropic factors that get activated, glucose levels that get changed and uh, stimulate those neural stem cell pools to make more. I don't know the specific example, um, which is what I think this question is getting at in terms of thinking about whether you would get new stem cells that would contribute to glucose regulation. So for example, in the pancreas. Um, and that I don't know the answer to, but um, I think we will have again, a diabetes lecture next year coming up. So I would encourage you to tune in then because we might be able to have uh, an expert on board who would be better suited for that one. For sure. Good question though. It was a great question. So I think we're 18 after and we had some fantastic questions. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, if you would all virtually join me in thanking our two speakers tonight, Dr. Botvinnik and Dr. Zhao. And once again, um, thanks very much to the community who attended. I hope this was useful. It's challenging for all of us. Um, uh, to, I think, not see people face to face, but hopefully we're going to be moving through this period. Um, our very best wishes to everyone in the audience and the community that we've been interacting with over the last two years now, really, in terms of this lecture series. Hopefully your, your family, your friends, everyone is well and stay safe. Um, and we'll see how things go. Okay. So thanks again and uh, good night. Nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good job, Wayne. Okay. <clears throat>